story seven of stories weird and wonderful this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Weird and Wonderful by J. E. Muddock. John MacDougall's Double. It boots not to indicate the precise locale of the truly remarkable incidents I am about to narrate. It is true that the many years that have passed have caused the details to fade from the public memory but nevertheless there are reasons why the identity of the person and region should be concealed though no doubt some of those who read this will recognize the spot from the description that follows being of a studious disposition and loving solitude it was long my habit to make journeys on horseback through the least frequented parts of the country this mode of locomotion suited me for i was a valetudinarian and the exercise was necessary to my well-being i loved to dream too to work out problems as i rode along and it suited my peculiar temperament to start off on these journeys in an aimless way that is to lay down no rule or route but to wander just where the spirit of the hour or some passing fancy led me it thus chanced that in the summer of eighteen something i started for a week's holiday in this eccentric fashion and turned my horse's head northward it was my custom to carry such refreshments as i might require during the day in a small knapsack and being a very abstemious man rather however from compulsion than choice my needs were few and simple at night i usually managed to find accommodation and hospitality for man and beast in some village hostelry or roadside inn i loved the out-of-the-way places rural simplicity and quietness and in so far as i followed any fixed plan i was careful to avoid the great commercial centres and the thronged highways the leafy lanes the woodland tracks the breezy moorlands were more to my taste one sunny afternoon i found myself in a very wild but picturesque part of the country heather-clad hills rose up in a sort of amphitheatre save to the west where there was a break and the eye travelled out to a great strip of the blue atlantic ocean whose ponderous billows foamed on the iron rocks that terminated the land on that side it had been a sullen morning sultry and gloomy the sky had been cloudless and the sea of a sepia tint illuminated here and there with passing shafts of light that gleamed from rents in the clouds there had been such an utter absence of motion in the air that the sullenness and the deceptive calm impressed one with a sense of impending disaster as the afternoon advanced it became more evident that a storm was brewing and not deeming it wise to longer ignore the portents i began to cast about me for some place of shelter the country however might have been in the heart of uninhabited africa for any sign there was of human life the landscape moreover was so much broken up by depressions rises and strips of woodland that only a very limited area could be surveyed by the eye of the traveller who knew not therefore whether the next dip or next rise would reveal the presence of some snug and nestling village or town the main road was badly kept and must have been a mere quagmire in the winter 
many bypaths and tracks ran off at various angles but there was nothing to indicate where the paths led to though it was reasonable to suppose that they had some connection with human dwellings already heavy drops of rain had commenced to fall and warned me to lose no further time in seeking shelter but where that was the question i reined in my horse stood up in the stirrups and ran my eye all round but i could see no signs of a house about a quarter of a mile ahead the road was carried through a cutting and in the absence of anything better i thought that would afford at least partial shelter i therefore gave my beast his head just as a blinding zigzag of lightning tore through the black heavens and seemed to burst open the floodgates for down came the rain in a deluge i remember nothing like it for suddenness and severity it was really as if some upholding force had been swept away causing the water to tumble out of the heavens in unbroken streams in less than a minute an extraordinary burst of thunder shook the solid earth causing my good steed to swerve and manifest every indication of fright he was a faithful intelligent animal that had carried me many hundreds of miles but he was exceedingly sensitive and nervous and so i patted his neck coaxed him and spoke kindly in his ear and he consented to go forward until we entered the cutting the banks of which on each side rose to a considerable height and were densely wooded the consequence being that the road hereabouts was wrapped in gloom once more there leapt from the sky a vivid flash of fire followed almost immediately by a peal of thunder that was like the roll of heavy artillery my horse reared and plunged to such an extent that i slipped out of the saddle in order to lead him by the bridle and as i did so i was surprised to see a strange wild-looking man standing in the very centre of the road he was hatless and his long dark hair was sodden with the rain while his face seemed to me to be cadaverous and white he was tall and powerful and dressed somewhat after the fashion of a gamekeeper he wore a woollen shirt that was open at the neck and revealed a considerable portion of the upper part of his chest that i noted was covered with a mass of dark hair he seemed utterly indifferent to the pouring rain and had the appearance of one who was drenched to the skin yet he stood there motionless and unconcerned and as it appeared to me with a savage glowering expression on his face hailing him i asked if there was a place of shelter or a house near and at that moment my horse swerved again as the heavens were once more illuminated with the lightning this distracted my attention for some moments as by the toss of his head he nearly pulled the bridle out of my hand when i had pacified him and turned to address the man i was dumbfounded to find that he was no longer there i called loudly two or three times but there was no response and i began to ask myself whether my senses had not deluded me for what manner of man could it have been who could thus have ignored my question seeing the plight and distress i was in but i put the idea of a delusion from me as unworthy of serious thought i had noted every detail of the strange man and could have sworn to him amongst a thousand then suddenly it occurred to me that he was a robber that he had companions near and had gone to warn them of my approach i therefore drew out a double-barrelled pistol i always carried in my knapsack 
and put it into the side pocket of my coat ready for immediate use in case of need i advanced for some yards leading the horse and keeping my eyes about me but i saw no sign of human being and the only sounds i heard were the rushing of the rain and the shriek of the wind through the trees fortunately on one side of the road was a large hollow from which stone had been taken the top part projected very much and was overhung with trees so that it afforded a partial shelter i placed my horse against the rock and still held his bridle on my arm and thrusting my free hand in my pocket i grasped my pistol and waited in suspense expecting every moment to be attacked for it had become a conviction with me that the man i had seen was a footpad perhaps a gypsy and that he would presently return with companions and attempt to murder and rob me but an hour or more passed and he had not made his appearance gradually the storm died away and the sky was enlivened by little patches of dark blue though over the hills hung dense and ragged masses of sombre clouds mounting my horse once more i rode forward and in a little while i debouched upon an extraordinarily weird-looking stretch of country the gloaming was falling the blue strips of sky had deepened and a strange wild stormlight came from seaward as i saw the landscape under these atmospheric aspects there was something positively ghastly about it here and there were groups of grotesque and distorted trees huddled together in the gloom like whispering conspirators and these were alternated by open spaces encircled by boulders that were suggestive of forgotten altars of some unholy worship as i rode on in the gathering darkness quickening my pace in my anxiety to find some shelter for the night i passed straggling birch trees whose white trunks gleamed ghostly and pallid amongst the deeper shades around there were lonely pools begirt with rustling reeds and from them now and again arose the melancholy boom of the bittern on the banks of the streamlet now hoarsely gurgling after the heavy rain were blasted and stunted trees that in the uncertain light looked like withered witches who brooding on some deed of blood had suddenly been stricken stiff by some avenging power as i rode through this nightmare landscape over which the shades of darkness were fast falling there was occasionally a whir of wings and a harsh cry startled me from time to time owls darted across my path looking like little grey ghosts and frogs croaked hoarsely in the reeds i gave my beast the bridle he lengthened his strides the tree trunks ran into one another overhead blinked a star or two between the rifts i seemed to lose my identity and to be swept onward a flying phantom in a land of shadows in a little while i perceived a light ahead and had no doubt that it proceeded from a human habitation so putting my horse to his fastest trot i soon came to a whitewashed building that i saw at once was an inn and never did jaded traveller welcome an inn as i did this alighting i rapped on the door with my riding whip and immediately there appeared a buxom jovial red-cheeked woman who in answer to my query as to whether i could have lodging and refreshment for myself and horse said certainly and ringing the bell for the ostler to whom she gave instructions to care for my beast she led me into the house and lighting a candle in a brass stand 
that gleamed like gold she showed me upstairs and into a room that was redolent with lavender and comfortably furnished the linen of the bed was white as driven snow and the mahogany furniture polished until it was like a mirror having changed my clothes and refreshed myself with a wash i descended to the dining-room where the same scrupulous cleanliness and care were displayed a snowy cloth was on the table that was spread with good things a luscious ham a roasted chicken fresh butter delicious honey homemade bread tea toast etc to all of which i did ample justice for i was as hungry as a hunter the genial landlady waited upon me and chatted pleasantly the while and from her i learned that the town of e was only two miles away her name was macdougall and she and her husband had kept the house for something like ten years it stood on the estate of the duke of d and john macdougall was a gamekeeper in the service of his grace having made a most hearty meal and ascertained that my horse had been well cared for i filled my pipe and my hostess said that if i did not object she had no doubt her husband would be glad to keep me company i thanked her for the suggestion assured her that i should be delighted and throwing myself on a couch i fell to dreaming pleasant dreams as i watched the smoke from my pipe curl ceiling wood in about ten minutes a knock came to the door and in reply to my come in the landlord john macdougall presented himself as i cast my eyes upon him i almost uttered a cry of amazement for he bore such a striking resemblance to the weird-like creature i had seen on the road during the thunderstorm and who had been deaf to my entreaties for assistance as i rose into a sitting posture i said i think we've met before indeed when an hour or two ago in the cutting there on the road and during the time that the storm was at its height you are certainly mistaken sir he answered with a laugh i have been in the gamekeeper's lodge on the duke of d s estate all the afternoon and having been up the whole of the previous night i slept for some hours and was not disturbed by the storm i was incredulous and stared at the man trying to read his thoughts but his dark eyes met mine fearlessly and his face was full of frank openness moreover his face was not cadaverous and ghostly like that of the man i had seen on the road but was plump and rubicund but still in all other respects he was a facsimile rising i extended my hand and he took it and as i held his i peered into his dark eyes and said can you solemnly say you have never looked upon me before most solemnly he exclaimed at any rate not to my knowledge i was puzzled but not convinced i could not dismiss from my mind the idea that in some way the man was deceiving me yet as i studied him i found that in some details he differed from the man i had seen on the road though the details chiefly had reference to the wildness of the eyes and the white ghastly face my host's eyes were soft and mild almost like a fawn's while his face as i have already said was round and rubicund i did not discuss the subject further with john macdougall but i felt there was something strange some mystery to be accounted for and i confess to having had a yearning desire 
to clear the mystery up when i rose on the following morning i found there was a daughter of the house by name rosa a pretty dark-eyed dark-haired girl of two or three and twenty unmistakably macdougall's daughter but while she had his features and complexion she was fragile with a pale thoughtful pensive face she was a pleasant girl with a sweet voice and engaging manner so that i was glad to converse with her with rustic ingenuousness she offered to conduct me to the ruins of a notable castle that overhung the sea a mile and a half away and gladly accepting her company i started on foot i found her well versed in the topography of the country as well as its local history and she afforded me much information the ruins were singularly picturesque they stood on a bold wind-swept rock around whose base the atlantic billows ceaselessly made war as i stood in the ruins listening to the thunder of the waters and drinking in deep draughts of the rich ozonized air that came off the face of the ocean something prompted me to tell rosa of my little adventure of the preceding day and i wound up with saying when i saw your father i was amazed at the likeness he bore to the strange being i met in the road as i made this remark i saw the girl turn deadly pale while in a voice that seemed to me to ring with sorrow she said it must have been my father's double you saw at first i did not know whether to take this in earnest or whether it was a mere expression that had no implied meaning but before i could make any reply she exclaimed with every indication of mental anguish oh how foolish of me to tell you that you who are an utter stranger i was struck with the girl's manner moreover what she told me at once afforded an explanation of the mystery and though there were plenty of people who would have laughed the idea to scorn as unworthy of even a passing thought from men of sense i was not one of them and yet i had generally been credited with possessing an average amount of sense but i am a believer in the occult sciences i have always been of opinion that there are mighty wonders in connection with our natures of which we have no conception so your father has a double then i remarked with solemn gravity yes yes she answered in trepidation but i cannot speak more about it please let us go back she was evidently affected so that i had not the hardihood to ply her with further questions but complied with her request my interest however had been aroused and i resolved to try and learn something more about john mcdougall's double on leaving my home it had been my intention to be absent a week the week had already expired but i found this country inn so comfortable and attractive that i was induced to prolong my stay fortunately i was pretty well master of my time and so had no need to consult any one that afternoon rosa came to me and in a distressful voice and with tears in her eyes she said oh sir i pray you mention nothing to my parents of what i told you this morning when the subject is referred to in my father's presence it almost drives him mad i promised her that i would keep my own counsel but i was determined to learn something more before leaving the neighbourhood the subject had a perfect fascination for me and i could not resist it 
being naturally of an inquisitive temperament i asked many questions about many things of the old country people who resided in the neighbourhood and i soon learned that for a long time they had been living in a state of terror owing to a series of truly astounding murders while all attempts to detect the perpetrator of these crimes had failed first there was a woman a hawker found in a ditch by the roadside then a farm labourer who had been ploughing all day and was returning with his horses in the evening was killed near a wood again a well-known farmer who had been to the market town was discovered the following morning dead on the highway his horse browsing near by this was followed by the murder of a servant girl in a field then a sailor on tramp was the victim and finally a country carrier who had travelled the road for many years went to swell the list now these crimes were in the highest degree mysterious for in no case was robbery the motive the deceased's belongings being intact while all the victims without exception were killed by being strangled with the hand the throat of each was black and bruised and showed unmistakably the deep indents of thumbs and fingers every endeavour possible even to the offering of a large reward had been made to discover the author of these extraordinary murders but without avail nothing was got that would even justify a suspicion against any particular person then again what was the motive which prompted the outrages it seemed to be literally a mere love of killing i was greatly interested and pondered deeply on the subject and i tried by every process of reasoning to find some feasible theory of the crimes the absence of apparent motive only added of course to the inscrutable mystery one thing was certain the murderer must have been a remarkably powerful man to accomplish his purpose as he had done and a cunning man also to have defied detection so long suddenly as i dwelt upon the subject it flashed across my mind that john mcdougall was the murderer through his double i could not help this thought as i remembered that wild fierce powerful fellow i had seen on the road of course your men of common sense as they would have been pleased to have termed themselves would have laughed me to scorn for such an idea but it was not my habit to reject a proposition as untenable simply because known laws would not apply to it and very soon i was to receive a fearful practical illustration that i was right at the end of my week's stay at the inn a new guest arrived he was a traveller for the great firm of b and company of manchester he was a little sharp-eyed genial man who had been on the road for many years and was full of anecdote and bonhomie we soon struck up an acquaintance and spent the evening together until a late hour when we both retired he occupied a room next to mine and about four o'clock in the morning i was awakened by an extraordinary sound proceeding from his room daylight was already breaking and a soft rosy light was stealing over the landscape and showing through my blind i sprang out of bed and listened and i became convinced i could hear the scuffling of feet and a strange gurgling sound as if someone was gasping for breath and was in great pain instantly a terrible thought seized me and rushing out of my own room i hurried to my neighbour's flinging open his door without knocking then 
i was rooted to the spot with horror for in the uncertain light i discerned a sight that froze my blood on the bed was the commercial traveller and standing at the side was the fierce wild man who had confronted me in the cutting on the road his hands were round the traveller's throat before i could recover from the shock he turned upon me his face was fiendish in its fierce expression foam was about his lips and his eyes blazed like living coals with a sudden movement he strode over to me and with a sweep of his arms hurled me into a corner i think i must have been stunned for there was a blank that i could not fill up when i recovered it was almost full daylight i rose and went to the bed and was appalled to find that the commercial traveller was dead he had been strangled and his throat was swollen and black i hurried to john mcdougall's room the door was locked but putting my shoulder to it i burst it open john mcdougall was in his bed he was in a deep trance-like sleep and his breathing was not perceptible his face was deathly pale but placid i called him by his name and shook him but without avail his wife who slept in an adjoining room came rushing in i told her that murder had been done in the house and her husband was the murderer she uttered a wild shriek of despair and exclaimed it is false my husband sleeps as you see i was dumbfounded in the presence of this awful mystery for mystery it was was i a victim of some horrible nightmare no for in a few minutes the aroused household discovered that the commercial traveller had been too surely strangled it was eight o'clock before john mcdougall awoke from his strange sleep he looked dazed and ill and i shrank from him as from something uncanny i had dispatched a messenger to the town for the police who soon arrived and an investigation into the circumstances of the crime was made my position was a most unenviable one i had absolutely witnessed the murder had seen the murderer and recognized him as a man i had met before and who was exactly like john mcdougall and yet within half an hour at the most of my witnessing the crime i beheld john mcdougall soundly sleeping in his bed as a truthful man i could do no more than state what i had seen and the result was mcdougall was arrested in due course he was brought to trial and i was forced to appear as a witness against him the story i told naturally created amazement and incredulity the prisoner's wife and daughter who usually slept with her mother in the room adjoining that of the prisoner swore that to the best of their belief he had never left his room on the night of the crime his employer the duke of d gave him an excellent character as a quiet inoffensive man as did also his neighbours and save for my story there was nothing at all to connect him with the murder the result was that every one believed the murder had been committed by another man resembling john mcdougall and the prisoner was acquitted and he and his family emigrated to australia though he himself never reached that country he disappeared suddenly one night and was never seen again it was supposed that he either jumped or fell overboard the murderer of the commercial traveller in the lonely inn and of the six other persons all of whom had been killed in the same manner by strangulation 
was never discovered and never will be till the end of time all the circumstances of the crimes were involved in awful mystery that defied human penetration but i have never had any doubt in my own mind that the unfortunate people were done to death by john mcdougall's double who was his double can there be any other answer than that while the real man was in a sort of trance state his other self fierce and bloodthirsty issued forth to prey like a ghoul on those with whom he came in contact and often have i shuddered as i have remembered how i met this ghoul in the lonely cutting during the thunderstorm and who but for some inexplicable reason would have added me to his list of victims truly there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy end of story seven story eight of stories weird and wonderful this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by mark mosako stories weird and wonderful by j e muddock story eight the bride of death the house of sabine had ever been noted for the beauty and queenliness of its women but none surely had ever been more beautiful and juno-like than patricia sabine she was indeed worthy of her house and her house was proud of her the sabines were an ancient race whose proud boast it was that they had descended from that line of grand old norse kings of whom fritjof the bold was such a distinguished representative and in the library of the sabine mansion the fritjof saga emblazoned on silk and framed in a frame of pure red gold hung on the wall for the family were proud of this redoubtable ancestor and honored his memory by thus framing the romance of which he was the hero the beauty of a woman may be suggested by words but they must ever fail to do full justice to the subject for it is by the eye alone that beauty can be best understood there is in fact a beauty that neither words nor brush can paint a beauty that owes much to the warm flush of light i am still referring to feminine beauty the delicacy of coloring in the skin the wondrous changes of expression the magic of the eyes the grace of carriage the sweetness of voice these are things that defy the artist and penman alike the greeks of old gave us beauty in their sculptures but after all it was the beauty of death it is well however that the reader should know something of patricia sabine even though the picture has but a faint resemblance to the original grace of mould perfection of limb stateliness of carriage were qualities which had ever been characteristic of the sabine with a certain imperiousness which was an added charm for such a type of human nature would have been imperfect had it lacked lordliness the norse blood was easily traceable in patricia in the tall stately figure the clear deep-set blue eyes not the pale sickly blue which accompanies the lymphatic temperament but that wondrous violet such as one sees in the waters that lave the islands of the west indies but which must ever be a stranger to the painter's palette for it is one of the hues that the cunning of man has never yet been able to wring from nature and fringing these eyes were long silken lashes and framing them were arched eyebrows of wondrous perfectness the complexion of the face was literally that of the peach than which it is difficult even if we ransack nature to imagine anything more delicate more perfect in its blending of tones or more exquisitely chaste 
a straight nose with quivering nostrils that responded to every passing emotion, even as an aeolian harp responds to the lightest of zephyrs, lips that had the coral's redness, and in their curve the grace of Ulysses' bow. Her teeth were as ivory, and gleamed, even as wet ivory gleams, when her lips were parted. But even such a face as this, a face that wanted nothing in each individual feature to make up a perfect whole, would still have been imperfect, had it lacked that crown of a woman's adornment, the hair. Truly, her hair was Patricia's glory. It was a glory of the sun's red gold, and when it fell about her, it was like a veil, and might have excited envy in the breast even of one of the mythological sea-nymphs, whose locks served completely to enfold them. Fortunately for her, the hideous fashion of gathering the hair up tightly from the neck and pleating it up in a lump on the crown of the head had not come into vogue. But even if it had, and she had chosen to wear hers so, her nuke would have stood the test of the most rigid criticism. I have used this French word because it expresses so much and is so wholly untranslatable. For while in one sense it means the nape of the neck, it also has reference to the curved swell of the back part of the head, which embraces the base of the ears and the top part of the neck. Many a woman who gathers up her hair and drags it tightly from the neck is all forgetful how few there are who can afford to expose this part of the neck. For where the lines are rigid and pronounced, and the ears bulge away from their base, the artistic eye is shocked, and the canons of true art are outraged. But Patricia Sabine had nothing to fear in this respect. Her dainty head was joined to dainty shoulders by a swan-like neck, absolutely faultless in its lines and curves. I confess to a fear that some who read this description may think I have exaggerated, for, alas, it is sadly true that the ideal beauty in modern women is rarely seen. It is sacrificed to the artificial style of living and the Moloch of fashion. But Patricia came from a race who through long generations had been famous for their beauty, and she seemed to have inherited the type in its most exalted aspect. It will be readily supposed that such a woman lacked not lovers. Men there were who would have dared the horrors of Hades itself for her favoring smile. But sighs and entreaties were alike unavailing until she met Jasper Rail. It is difficult to tell why she was attracted by him, unless it was due to some powerful magnetic influence which she could not resist. Rail was a strange man, in stature less than she, with eyes that were as dark as sloes and glowed like polished ebony. His hair, in striking contrast to hers, was jet black, his complexion swarthy and colorless. His type was Spanish, and he had the Spaniard's fire, the Spaniard's pride. He was not handsome, and yet he was attractive. But in what that attractiveness lay would have puzzled any mere casual observer to determine. There was something mystic about him that defied penetration. Although his family had long been settled in England, he had spent many years of his life in the East and had wandered in some of the remotest parts of Egypt where the foot of the ordinary traveler rarely treads. Physically, Jasper and Patricia might have mated with advantage, but temperamentally they were opposed to each other. She represented the sunshine and wine of life, he the gloom and the sorrow. She was open and frank as the day, he was given to esoteric. And yet she became fascinated with him, and he talked burning, passionate love to her. But the connection did not meet the approval of her family. They named many reasons why it was inexpedient for her to marry him. But their most forcible and unanswerable objection, perhaps, was that he was a dreamer, not a worker. His wanderings, extensive as they had been, seemed to have all been aimless. 
he had not enriched the world by adding to its knowledge, and he appeared to have devoted his time to gathering up the mystical lore of the countries through which he passed. He must have had some idea that his suit would not find favor with her relatives, for one night, as they returned from a visit to some of his friends, he suddenly seized her hand, and with passionate exclamation said, Patricia, do you really love me? It was a brilliant, frosty night. The air was crisp and crystalline. The stars shone with an arctic splendor. The moon was like a shield of burnished silver. The lovers had preferred to walk, though a carriage was at their disposal, for they wanted the joy of love's sweet dalliance. Their way was along a lonely road, shaded by giant beeches, through whose tangled branches the moonlight fell, and was wrought into gleaming filigree work on the ground below. And all around the landscape lay in the shimmering light, looking like an unreal land, or rather a land of mystery, for all was so still, the shadows were so impenetrable, the lighted parts so dreamlike in the silver sheen. Some little distance off, sunk in a hollow, was a large tarn, partly in shadow and partly in light, and it needed but a very small stretch of imagination, as one gazed at it with the glamour of the night about it, to fancy that strange beings from the spirit world were gliding over its mirror-like surface. Surely it must have been in such a spot as this that the beautiful but erring Queen Guinevere met her lover Sir Launcelot of the lake. Patricia was a little startled by her lover's brusqueness, and she made answer with somewhat faltering accents. Yes, but your question seems to imply a doubt on your part. It does imply a doubt, he replied. I do not feel sure of you. Nay, start not. You know that your people are opposed to me. That is true, but have I not told you that I am yours? You have. But in what way have I influenced you? A little shudder thrilled her at this question, and she answered, By some power you possess, and to which I cannot give a name, I am drawn to you irresistibly. You have for me the attraction that the lodestone has for the needle. He burst into a strange laugh that had mockery in it, and said with some bitterness, I understand you are influenced by me, but you do not really love me? You have no right to say that, she replied, with a rising inflection in her tone. I speak as I feel and think, said he firmly. I see into your heart and read it. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean to say that you are deceiving me willfully. You think you love me. Nay, I am sure, she answered in low tones, and in spite of herself, experiencing a sense of shrinking from him, for he spoke so strangely, and his piercing eyes in which the moonlight was reflected seemed capable of reading her most secret thoughts. I am sure that I love you, he exclaimed with passionate energy, and seizing her in his arms, he kissed her with the burning passion of an ardent lover. Then, with the abruptness peculiar to him, he stopped, and holding both her hands in his, while he peered fixedly into her eyes, he said, You know, Patricia, that according to the mythology of the Persians, every star in the heavens has its special spirit, and every man has his attendant star which receives him at death. This is something more than mythology to me, it is truth. My star and your star are with us now, and hear our words. In their hearing, vow that you love me to all eternity. She was half frightened of him. He had never talked like this before. Was it wine in his head, or madness? She asked herself. The expression of his face was strange. His fiery eyes seemed to burn into her very soul. She could not help but recoil from him. But he drew her forward again and asked, Are you afraid to confess your love now that I have told you two spirits are witnesses? What nonsense are you talking, she said. Nonsense, he cried with a hoarse laugh. Nonsense because you cannot see what I can see? 
I see two strange forms that walk beside us. They are shadowy and dreamlike, but still I see them, and they shall be witnesses to your vow. What vow? she asked in tremulous tones. I want you to vow solemnly now, with all those burning stars looking down upon us, and in the face of that peerless moon, and in the presence of these ghostly witnesses, that you love me, and will be bride to no one but me. She could not be indifferent to his unusual and peculiar manner. Never before had he exhibited this phase of his character, and she was really alarmed. But with the boldness and firmness of her race, she made answer thus, Jasper, I will vow nothing or tell you nothing while you are in this strange mood. Conduct me at once to my home, and if that is not agreeable to you, I will go alone. He appeared to be deeply hurt. An expression of pain and sorrow swept across his swarthy face. He bowed lowly and with frigid politeness, and offering her his arm, uttered the one word, Come. They walked along in silence for some distance. Then he suddenly said, Patricia, if you and I are not wedded in life, we shall be wedded in death. No other man but I can ever possess you. Mark every word of this. It is well that you should. He spoke with such emphasis, such solemnity, that again she shuddered, and when a little later he bade her good night on the steps of her home and pressed his cold lips to hers, she felt a positive relief that the moment for parting from him had come. That night's experience opened her eyes, and she saw what she had been unable to see before. She saw that this strange man with his gloomy and supernatural views was not fitted to be her mate, and that it would be the height of folly for her, who was so richly endowed and so deeply impressed with the joyousness of living, to wed herself to him. Up to that night, she had really believed that she loved him, but she was fully conscious now that he had exerted a power over her, a power that had fascinated her, but had not won her heart. How could there be love between two natures so utterly at variance? The result of her reasoning was that on the following day she wrote him a not unkindly, but at the same time a firmly expressed letter, in which she pointed out that happiness was not at all likely to come out of a union between them. She dwelt upon their want of similarity in tastes, and of her abhorrence of the views he held, and concluded with saying that the engagement was broken, and that he must seek someone for a wife who was more suited to him. For a few days she heard nothing of him. Then he came to the house and besought an interview, but fearing to trust herself in his presence, she resolutely declined to see him, and two or three days later he sent a note containing these lines. Remember our last interview, and what I said. These were my words. Patricia, if you and I are not wedded in life, we shall be wedded in death. No other man but I can ever possess you. Mark every word of this. It is well that you should. For a little time she could not shake off a feeling of depression. She did not like to believe that she was in the least degree superstitious, and yet she had to own that she was affected in an unaccountable way. She recalled his wild manner on that solemn starlit night when he had given utterance to those words, as if he had been inspired and was prophesying. As the weeks rolled away, however, and she neither saw nor heard anything of her strange lover, the feeling of depression wore off, and she blamed herself for having been so easily affected. But occasionally, with remarkable suddenness and vividness, the scene of that night came before her mental vision, and she saw it again as if it were an actual reality. There were the dark blue sky gemmed with its myriads of scintillating stars, the moon clear as a silver shield, the great beech trees, the filigree work woven from light and shadow on the road, the country bathed in a dreamy light, the glittering tarn, every detail and every point of the scene rose up before her, and also the spirit of the scene, the remarkable man who had breathed a passionate recital of love to her, 
and had asked her to vow her love for him in the presence of the astral spirits those spirits of the stars which he said were to be witnesses to the vow she would have liked to have forgotten him entirely but that seemed an impossibility his dark wild face and his fiery eyes haunted her six months passed and she heard nothing whatever of him save a rumor that he had gone to egypt again then she met ernest willoughby lord d son of that lord d who so distinguished himself during the crimean war and who died of wounds and privations in the trenches before sebastopol ernest himself a gallant soldier who had already seen much service was a year or two her senior he was handsome brave frank and full of life and spirits a striking contrast indeed to jasper rail his family were noble too and wealthy so that a match between the two houses was one that strongly recommended itself to both parties almost from the first time of meeting the young people fell in love and it would have been difficult to have found a couple more suited to each other her peerless beauty was well matched by his splendid figure and handsome face there was no serious love-making however until two months later when he sought permission to pay his addresses to her and as she was nothing loth they stood pledged to each other as lovers but before she gave him her pledge she honestly told him of her connection with jasper rail jasper rail he exclaimed as he heard the name and then after reflecting for some minutes he said i wonder if it is the same jasper rail i met once in egypt he was at hermopolis when i was there and subsequently we journeyed down the nile together yes it must be the same she cried for he has been much in egypt and i have heard him say he was at hermopolis well if it is the same man ernest said somewhat contemptuously he is a half-mad mystic who professed to have studied the occult sciences of the egyptians i remember i offended him very much because i laughed at him and told him he would land himself in a lunatic asylum when he told me he had the power of holding converse with the spirits of the dead patricia shuddered and said well don't let us talk any more of the man though i think i ought to tell you this he assured me that if i did not become his wife i should never be wife to anyone else did he threaten you asked ernest quickly and firing up with anger oh no not exactly that he spoke as it were prophetically well you can afford to treat that sort of thing with contempt answered ernest the prophecies of such a crack-brained noodle are not in the least likely to come true perhaps not answered patricia but the manner in which she said this showed that she was still to some extent affected by rail's influence but from that moment he was not referred to again by the lovers who by mutual consent decided that henceforth his name should be a dead letter between them the adage that the course of true love never did run smooth was not to be verified in their case nothing occurred to interrupt the harmony of their wooing and never were a man and woman prouder of each other than they were ernest was in the habit of saying that the world had not such another woman as patricia but lovers have said that sort of thing since time began nevertheless patricia sabine all things considered would have been difficult to outrival for allied to beauty of no ordinary kind were a most winning tenderness and a true womanly nature everyone who knew these two predicted for them a long life of unalloyed happiness the star of good fortune seemed to shine with the most perfect effulgence over their path the day of the wedding came at last the marriage as befitted the union of two such houses was to be a grand one and to be solemnized in the parish church of the bride's native town it was summer time and over the glad earth was cast a robe of beauty into which a wealth of color had been wrought a wet spring followed by long brilliant days had like a cunning alchemist turned the cloddy earth to glittering gold but on the very morning 
a morning brilliant with sunlight, while the air was languid with the scent of a thousand flowers and palpitating with the passionate melody of the birds, when Patricia Sabine rose joyous at the thought that in a few hours she would become the bride of the man to whom she had given her heart and with whom she hoped to journey through life until in the fullness of time, like a good and faithful servant whose duty had been well done, she would pass to that higher life where happiness knoweth no blight. Her maid put a letter into her hand. It was a large square envelope with the device of a serpent on the flap. At any other time, she might have been struck by the eccentricity of this device, but now she was all eagerness, all excitement, for her bridal dress and wreath were there ready to dawn, and a woman on her bridal morn has no eyes for trivialities that do not bear upon the business of the hour. So she tore the envelope open. It contained a sheet of parchment-like paper, at the head of which was the same device of a serpent, and in addition in the left-hand corner was a veiled shadowy figure, whether male or female it was impossible to tell, for the form was only suggested by the diaphanous veil that enveloped it. And over the head of the figure floated a golden star on the paper, written in red ink was this line, We shall be wedded in death, no other man but I can possess you. There was no address, no signature, no date, but these things were not needed to tell her whose hand had penned those cruel words. The paper fluttered to the ground, and with a little cry she reeled against her toilet table, and her maid in alarm sprang to her assistance, but she recovered herself in a few moments and said, Oh, how stupid of me, Marie! Forgive me for alarming you. It is nothing. She laughed, but it was a laugh without laughter in it, for once again before her mental vision came back the scene of that wintry night, and she saw the dark, flashing, sinister eyes of Jasper Rail peering into hers. She picked up the sheet of paper. She tore it into little shreds and threw them into the grate, but she could not so easily get rid of the strange, nervous dread that had seized her. Her beautiful face was clouded, and some of its color had faded away, while in those wonderful violet eyes was a restless expression, as though she half expected to see Rail's strange, weird face come before her in reality. Why had he done such a cruel thing as this? Why, on that morning of all mornings, when the glad earth seemed to be singing an anthem of great joy, had he placed a sting in her heart? and overshadowed her brightness, which, on such an occasion, should have been perfect. It showed, at least, that he had not forgotten what they had been to each other, and this shaft had been leveled at her on her bridal morn by reason of the bitterness he felt. Presently she stood decked in her bridal robes, and as she surveyed herself in her mirrors, the magnificent picture that met her gaze even put rail out of her head. Truly she was magnificent, and so radiant in her beauty that a king might have been tempted to sell his kingdom to possess her. An hour later, when she walked up the aisle of the church, leaning on her father's arm to the altar, where her husband-elect stood ready to receive her, all the eyes of the assembled congregation were turned upon her in admiration. A bride more bride-like, more stately, more entrancing, it would have been difficult to picture, and through the eastern windows fell a glory and wealth of color, and from the organ rose peal upon peal of an anthem, while about the altar steps was a paradise of flowers. But amidst all this pomp and wealth, amongst all this color and beauty, the beauty of women and flowers, there was an unbidden guest whom no one, with one exception, saw, and this unbidden guest was Azrael. When the last words had been uttered, which made the twain one, there rose from one of the front pews a man, whose face was like the face of death, but whose eyes burned with a strange fire. He moved to the altar steps, gliding as it seemed rather than walking. So unearthly did he look in his pallor and the wildness of his expression, that those who saw him might have been pardoned for mistaking him for an apparition. 
but it was no apparition but jasper rail so rapid had been his movement that no one could stop him and suddenly he placed his hand on the bride's shoulder she turned to see who had touched her and then with a piercing cry of terror she fell back in her husband's arms rail was tottering on his feet a sickly greenish hue spread over his face and speaking in a husky gasping voice like one who was suffocating while he pointed his finger at the bride he uttered these strange words in my veins courses a deadly and subtle poison distilled from egyptian herbs i am death and you are my bride we cross the dark tide together he reeled like a sapling that is shaken in the wind something in the nature of a mocking laugh broke from his blue lips then he sank down on the altar steps a corpse then and not till then was the spell lifted that seemed to have bound the assembly during those awful moments for this unparalleled scene of horror was all enacted within a minute women fainted and men seemed to lose their heads with a wail of anguish the poor husband lifted his unconscious wife in his strong arms and bore her to the carriage and she was quickly conveyed back to the home from whence she had issued an hour or so ago so full of life so radiant in beauty so happy in the thought that she was soon to be the wife of her heart's choice medical aid was summoned from all quarters everything that human skill could do was done but rail's prophecy proved only too true she never rallied from the shock but ere the day was done death had claimed her and the lover husband and widower all within a day bowed his head over her sweet body and wept for he was a broken-hearted man jasper rail's revenge had been gratified his prophecy fulfilled if he was a madman he was possessed of more than the ordinary cunning of madness and no man surely ever planned a more thrilling and ghastly tableau than that which took place at the altar steps at a moment when the woman he had once professed to love became the wife of another if he had merely counted on the effect that the shock of his startling suicide would produce he had counted well but perhaps when he spoke on that memorable winter night he spoke with the certainty of foreknowledge perhaps some power that we know not of enabled him to see the whole scene as it was to occur but whatever it was there are some mysteries too inscrutable for human ken the result was the same and one of the most beautiful of women in the very fullness of her joy and happiness and in the first few minutes of her wifehood was claimed as the bride of death the bowed and stricken husband never recovered from the blow in active service abroad he sought that excitement which seemed the only thing calculated to prevent him from sinking into a condition of morbid melancholy but nothing could ever lift the great shadow that had fallen on his life that life ended however during the recent campaign in the soudan although his youth was far behind him and his hair was white with the snows of time he volunteered for active service and fell sword in hand on the burning sands of egypt while leading a little band of devoted followers against an overwhelming horde of arabs he sought a glorious death and found it end of story eight recording by mark losacco story nine of stories weird and wonderful this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon Stories Weird and Wonderful by J. E. Muddock Story 9. The Unbidden Guest A Story of a Christmas Joy Peace on earth, goodwill towards men, rang out the Christmas bells joyously over the frozen snow, but to one person at least they greeted harshly, inharmoniously, for they were suggestive of a never-dying sorrow. This person was Sir Wilfrid Woofenden, baronet of Pine Tree Hall, situated on the outskirts of the charming little village of Blank in Berkshire. Sir Wilfrid was a tall, patrician-looking man, who had once been handsome. 
but though not very old his hair was silver and his face seemed clouded with a sorrow that had no words pine tree hall had ever been noted for its hospitality and under its roof on this bright crisp morning when the bells from the village church rang out the old greeting was assembled a large number of guests but though christmas day always saw the hall crowded its owner knew no joy for the day was pregnant with a bitter memory and to explain this we must tell something of his family history he had married a lady of equal rank with himself and she had borne him two daughters ethel and muriel and one son wilfred the heir and hope of the house he was a fine lad and seemed to give promise of great things but that promise was not redeemed and though he was not dead in fact he was dead so far as his family was concerned his chair in the hall was ever empty his voice was never heard there even his portrait had been taken down from its accustomed place and no one would have had the hardihood even to have mentioned his name if he survived his father he would succeed to the title and estates that is the entailed portion of them but the old baronet had rashly sworn that while he himself lived his reprobate son should never touch a penny of his money let him go forth a beggar and starve in his shame and disgrace he had exclaimed in a fiery outburst of passion when he first heard that his one son and heir had brought dishonour upon his house truly this story was pitiable enough wilfred had been at rugby then at oxford but his career at college had been marked by excesses that were all but unpardonable even in an undergraduate he was engaged to be married to hester branscombe the only daughter of mrs branscombe the widow of major general branscombe who died in india the branscombes and the woofendens were very old friends major branscombe and sir wilfrid had been at college together and it had been the dearest wish of sir wilfrid's heart that his son should marry hester but young wolfenden was unusually wild and though he professed to be madly in love with hester he went off with a ballet dancer being first expelled his college and having forged mrs branscombe's name to a bill of exchange whereby he obtained a large sum of money sir wilfrid was thunderstricken when he heard the news that a scion of his house should have been guilty of such dishonour was almost impossible to believe but alas it was true enough and the disgrace the shame and the sorrow the scapegrace brought upon the two families could scarcely be told by words the baronet's pride was wounded to the quick and he said he would never hold up his head again he of course paid the money for the forged bill of exchange but that was the least part of the mischief the blow fell so heavily on hester that for some time her life was despaired of she gradually recovered however though it was generally acknowledged that she was never the same girl again her life was blighted and the brightness of her youth had left her she alone knew how much she loved the handsome daredevil wilfred who had often told her that without her life would not be worth living she believed that he was sincere in what he said and even when it was discovered that he had fled she refused to believe at first that he had deceived her but gradually the awful truth came home to her and when she recovered from her illness she put the sorrow deep down in her heart and had borne it there for ten long years she was a guest at the hall on this christmas day in fact she was never absent from these annual gatherings for between her and the mrs woofenden existed a sisterly friendship that nothing had ever interrupted pine tree hall was one of the old baronial mansions for which berkshire is famous it was said to have been originally built in richard the third's time and though it had been enlarged and improved by successive proprietors much of the original building still remained it stood in a grand park famous for its chestnuts and beeches and its turrets and towers were a conspicuous landmark for many miles round it was a family custom of the woofendens to worship in their village church on christmas morning and such of their guests as desired to do so accompanied them while another custom was that dinner on christmas day was always served at two o'clock the morning had been bright with a sharp frosty air there had been a heavy snowstorm some days previously and as no thaw had followed the snow lay thick on all the countryside as the afternoon approached however there was a change in the weather the barometer rose and snow commenced to fall again and by the time dinner was ended it was snowing heavily this put a stop to a sleighing party that had been organized and something else for the entertainment of the guests had to be thought of 
although the old baronet was the soul of hospitality his heart never seemed to be in the gatherings now for it was on a christmas day strangely enough that news of his son's shame and disgrace first reached him the day therefore could not fail to painfully remind him of the shadow that hung over his ancient house and though he never mentioned wilfrid's name and would allow no one else of the household to mention it there can be no doubt he thought much of him and his memory must often have reverted to the time when the merry golden-haired youngster was the life and joy of the old home so keen was his sorrow even now that he liked to give vent to it in solitude and would when he could do so without discourtesy retire to his library where he smoked and reflected on the terrible disappointment of his life as the snowstorm kept the guests indoors games of various kinds were indulged in for there was a considerable number of young people present and ethel and muriel took the lead in suggesting amusements to pass the time sir wilford had been able to withdraw without being missed and having shut himself in the library he had gone to sleep soon after darkness had set in and the lamps had been lighted muriel approached her sister and whispered the butler tells me that old nance is in one of her trance moods again would it not be fun to get her into the dining-room it might amuse the guests no answered ethel who was the elder i cannot countenance that why expose nance to ridicule oh very well ethel just as you like replied her sister a little piqued for she did not attach the importance to the old woman's trance moods that ethel did nance was an old servant of the family having been in the service for over forty years and had nursed all the children in their babyhood she had been greatly attached to wilfred and had been heard to say that she never could understand why his father had been so harsh to him but then nance had always been blind to his faults she was a gentle good-natured woman but was generally referred to by her fellow servants as being a little bit cracked she had earned this reputation owing to her belief in the supernatural to her ghosts were very real things and sometimes she went off into a sort of waking trance when she babbled of all sorts of wondrous things in spite of this eccentricity or whatever one liked to call it she had been as true as steel to the family and every member of it loved and honored her but while muriel used to laugh at nance's visions ethel had firm faith in them and she was fond of being alone with nance and listening to some of the marvellous stories from the old woman's apparently inexhaustible repertoire when nance fell into one of her so-called trance moods she did not as might be supposed go to sleep but became restless and excited wandering about her room waving her arms wildly her eyes wide open but apparently blank and fixed on space in this state she mumbled and muttered sometimes incoherently at others she would tell a plain straightforward narrative of what she saw and so startling and weird were some of her visions that it required a tremendous lot of faith to believe in them when nance recovered from this peculiarly morbid condition she vowed that she had no recollection of anything she had said or seen she was generally prostrated for two or three days after one of her attacks which were liable to be brought on by any undue excitement that she should have been seized therefore on this christmas night was not astonishing for every one in the house had been more or less excited during the day in a little while ethel stole away from the guests and went to nance's room the old woman was pacing up and down as usual her hair was dishevelled her eyes fixed and looking almost like glass she took no notice of ethel's entrance and did not seem in the least disturbed ethel sat down on the chair and watched nance's face with absorbed interest and the first words she caught were these he is lying sick unto death and he babbles of his home it is a strange country the sun always shines fiercely and there are great forests and savage beasts of whom do you speak asked ethel softly but nance heeded her not and continued it is a cruel fever that has laid him low but he fights it and battles with it and now he grows strong again she paused in her walk rested her hand on the table and stood like one who was listening intently trying to catch some sound suddenly she exclaimed or rather she hissed the words out hark they are coming always coming i hear them the old familiar footsteps there was another pause then she said they cease and she resumed her walk presently she began to speak again seemingly with great agitation and as if she was suffering much anguish how the storm wind blows the waves are rolling mountains high and the ship is tossed to and fro and i see him 
poor dear poor dear his eyes are sad and wistful and he looks wan and worn ah she cried with a little scream the ship is lost she strikes the rocks then after a breathless pause she added joyfully he is saved he is saved who is it who is saved ethel asked for sometimes the old woman would answer questions when in this state nance however did not answer this time and in a few minutes her face was once again contorted with seeming anguish and wringing her hand she exclaimed death is threatening him again he lies on a little bed in a hospital ward the swinging lamps show me his poor face so drawn so white but there are good nurses about him they are sisters of mercy they wipe his lips they give him food and medicine but always in his eyes is that wistful pleading look ah why is he not forgiven as she uttered the latter sentence she gave a great sigh and seemed much agitated and then it suddenly occurred to ethel that it was her brother wilfred the old woman was talking about and unable to control her feelings she broke into tears and said in a tone that scarcely rose above a whisper oh nance is it of wilfred you are speaking hush responded the old woman his name must not be mentioned here nance nance cried the poor girl in her great distress tell me does my dear brother live hush hark they are coming always coming i hear them the old familiar footsteps ethel was almost breathless now in her suppressed excitement and she hung on every utterance of the strange old woman for she had none of muriel's scepticism to her all this was terribly real and fascinating once more there's a ship at sea continued the old woman and i see him but always with that sad pale face with the yearning pleading eyes poor lad poor lad how he has suffered she became incoherent now and mumbled something that it was impossible to make sense out of then suddenly she stopped again and leaned on the table as before repeating her former words hark they are coming always coming i hear them the old familiar footsteps there was another spell of incoherency when once again she repeated as if it were a refrain hark they are coming always coming i hear them the old familiar footsteps ethel was greatly agitated she felt as if she must cry out to relieve her pent-up feelings but she managed to control herself nance's glazed eyes seemed to be staring through the wall now and with upraised finger she was repeating in a monotone they are coming coming always coming nance nance moaned ethel who is it you see tell tell me is it my dear brother yes whispered nance hoarsely but speak not his name he is always coming nearer he moves slowly and with pain ah oh, how sad how sad the fit seemed to be passing away and she fell panting on a sofa while her eyes lost their fixity and a cold perspiration broke out on her wrinkled face but with startling suddenness she sprang to her feet and with a cry of joy exclaimed he has come he has come having uttered these words she once more sank back in an exhausted condition but thrilling with strange excitement ethel caught her hand and asked pouring out her very soul as it were in the question where is he nance he is at the woodman's hut answered the old woman slowly and then she seemed to collapse the woodman's hut was the chief inn at the village and almost beside herself with excitement ethel called in a servant to attend to nance then noiselessly as a shadow she ran to her own room for what she had heard was to her a revelation she hurriedly put on a thick pair of boots enveloped herself in a huge cloak with a large hood that she drew over her head and partly concealed her face and without one thought of what the consequences might be she ran down the stairs and slipped out of the house by a side door and all unknown to anybody the snow was falling heavily the cold air revived her and for the first time she began to think that she was doing a foolish thing and being led by a phantom yet she could not turn back a something she could not account for seemed to draw her on if her act was an act of madness she could not help it she must go the village was a mile off and like a phantom herself she hurried along the country road it was not likely she would meet any one on that stormy christmas night for even the most depraved found shelter at such a time and no honest people were likely to be abroad but even if she should meet any of the neighbors or villagers she had no fear of being recognized it was a strange adventure for a young woman but she did not pause to think whether she was right or wrong 
all she knew was that some vague hope of seeing her beloved brother whom she had not seen for ten long years lured her on she reached the village at last all was silent the yew trees at the cottage doors looked like veritable ghosts the snow pattered softly down and lay in unsullied whiteness on the streets the door of the woodman's hut was closed but a cheery ruddy light from the great diamond-paned window of the kitchen streamed out across the snow-covered roadway now her courage failed her was she not bent on a foolish mission supposing the gabblings of old nance were nothing more than gabblings would she not look very foolish if she presented herself at the inn which was her father's property and the tenant her father's tenant what excuse could she make what could she say she the daughter of a baronet and lord of the manor to be there on such a night at such an hour for no better reason than that she had heard something uttered by an old woman in a trance the ridiculousness of the situation struck her so that she was actually turning away when a man came out of the doorway of the inn she recognized him as the boots and with a sudden impulse as she drew the hood of her cloak closer about her face she accosted him and asked have you a strange gentleman staying in the house yes mum her heart leapt into her mouth and she had to struggle to keep down her excitement as she asked the next question do you know his name he gave the name of richardson mum her hopes sank a little do you know where he has come from no mum but i think he's kind of a foreign gent but he's very ill and looks as if he was going to die ethel almost cried out the inn seemed to be swimming before her eyes and she actually reeled so that she clutched the man's arm take me to this strange gentleman and i will give you a sovereign she murmured the boots was much astonished but the thoughts of a sovereign put everything else out of his head so he pushed open the inn door and let her in trying to get a glimpse of her face as she came into the light down the long passage he led her and up the stairs to the first landing where he was going to knock at a door but she stopped him by grasping his arm is this his room she asked yes mum it's his sitting room thank you that will do she said then with trembling hands she opened her purse took therefrom a sovereign and put it into the man's hand you can leave me now boots was amazed at her strange conduct there was a mystery going on he thought and he was curious to know what it was so he stayed at the bottom of the stairs the poor girl feeling faint and weak tapped lightly at the door a man's voice called out come in she turned the handle and entered seated in a chair before a blazing fire was a heavily bearded man a huge fur rug was about his shoulders, and his cheeks were hollow, his face was wan and pale. With a low cry Ethel sprang forward, and falling on her knees uttered the one word, Wilfred. The man seemed amazed, and his white face became whiter. What, what, what does this mean? he stammered. You are Wilfred Wolfenden, she moaned, looking up into his sunken eyes. Not the same I knew ten long years ago, but my heart tells me you are my brother. And you are ethel your sister a great sob broke from the man and then he flung his arms around her and they sobbed together all unconscious that peering in at the doorway was the amazed boots looking as if he had been galvanized but he recognized ethel now and tearing down the stairs he rushed breathless into his master's presence and exclaimed master master what think you the strange gentleman up there is no other than young mr wilfred from the hall and miss ethel is along with him the brother and sister remained locked in each other's arms for some minutes. Then Wilfred briefly told her in outline his adventures. He had wandered the wide world over. He had been nigh unto death in India with jungle fever. He had been shipwrecked off the Cape of Good Hope on his way home. A relapse of illness sent him into the hospital at the Cape, where he was tenderly nursed. Then, feeling that his days were numbered, he came back to the old country, for he wanted to see the dear faces once more. He did not, however, intend to make himself known. He had no fear of being recognized, for he was utterly changed. His intention was to go to the hall on the following day, under an assumed name, and say that he had known Wilford in India. He relied upon the hospitable season for being admitted. Then, when he had once again looked upon the old place and the faces of those who were still dear to him, he was going back to India, never to return. Old Nance's trance, clairvoyance, second sight, or whatever it was, had upset all this, and in half an hour Ethel had her brother comfortably seated in a fly provided by the landlord of the inn, and then they drove to the hall, alighting before they reached the gate. 
Ethel smuggled her brother in, and the butler, who had been many years in the family, and had always been very fond of Wilfred when he was a boy, was taken into confidence. The wanderer was led to the library, Sir Wilfred being with his guests. Then Ethel hurried upstairs to change her boots and take off her wet cloak, and having arranged her ruffled hair, she went to the drawing-room. On her father's face a frown had gathered at her entrance. "'Where have you been to?' he asked. "'You have been missed and hunted for, but could not be found.' "'I have been doing a solemn duty, sir,' she said, "'and I have something to say to you. Will you please come with me to the library?' Then she beckoned her sister, and the three went to the library together. Ethel entered first. Wilford was sitting on the sofa, looking very ill indeed. The old baronet was amazed at the presence of a stranger, but some intuition told Muriel who it was. Ethel took her brother's hand, and bringing it to her father's, she said, "'Father, this is your erring son. God has sent him here tonight to crave your forgiveness.' The baronet fairly staggered, and with a passionate gesture drew his hand away. "'What is this mockery?' he growled angrily. "'It is no mockery, father,' answered Ethel solemnly, while Muriel folded her brother in her arms with a great cry of joy. "'Father,' continued Ethel, "'the ringers rang the bells in the village church this morning. Peace on earth, good will towards men.' She could say no more. For a moment or two the old man seemed undecided. Then, with a gulp in his throat, he grasped his son's hand, and in a raspy voice exclaimed, "'You are my son. There shall be peace and goodwill between us. I pray God to forgive me as I now forgive you.' Ethel slipped out of the room. In a few minutes she returned with her arm linked in that of Hester Branscombe. "'Hester,' she whispered, "'the wanderer has returned. The lost sheep has come back to the fold. This is Wilfred, my brother, and once your lover.' With a cry, Hester sank down and covered her face with her hands. Wilfred raised her up. Hester, he said tenderly, do not hate me and believe me when I solemnly vow that I have never ceased to love you. Nor I you, she murmured. That memorable Christmas night, the angel of sorrow departed from Pine Tree Hall as the angel of joy entered with his unbidden guest. To old Nance was due the reconciliation, for it was owing to her strange and even miraculous power that Wilfred was there, and she was called in to share the joy. But for long months the wanderer hovered between life and death, for his health had been much shattered. But with such nurses and such prospects, dying was out of the question, and slowly health came back, and before the next new year was many weeks old, he led Hester Branscombe to the altar. He had sinned and had been guilty of much folly, but he had purged his sin by suffering and anguish, and the joy was the greater in contrast to the sorrow that all had endured. It was a singular thing that old Nance never had another trance, but a little while before the Christmas following the one when she told of Wilford's coming, she was found dead in her bed. She had died in the night, calmly and without a pang. The family were inconsolable for her loss, and over her grave in the sweet village churchyard they erected a column of pure white marble, on which was carved this line, Here sleeps one of the most faithful of servants. End of story nine. Recording by Colleen McMahon.